I just begin by saying what an extraordinary act to have to follow? I think just never mind the semantics of like the least likely four word combination that I can imagine, Mormon transhumanist barbershop quartet has now been superseded by, first of all, a Mormon transhumanist barbership sextet, and now even more the experience of it. What an extraordinary acoustic reverie. I'm deeply grateful for the talent um, that has brought us all together and delighted to be with you today. Um, so I hope to offer today simply a kind of a passing speculative as ecumenical and as real um, exercise in the imagination of what AI could be and has been. Um, namely, there are, as we've noted, enormous great expectations uh, surrounding AI today. Um, predictions of co uh, compute in Claude uh, GPT-4 or Claude in the next 10 years are extraordinary. We have, of course, tech moguls um, and billionaires prophesying utopia on the one side and plenty of uh, safetyisms on the other is uh, decrying apocalypse. Uh, I will simply point out with Lee Vinsel that both of these participate in the same crita hype cycle that I think we need to take um, 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 a move away from. Here's, for example, uh, uh, here a logarithmic prediction of the cost of running the next generation uh, GPT-4 model. Deleuze once noted uh, that technological history was serrated, perhaps. This is what uh, he meant, namely that the cutting edge of innovation continues, uh, the blue dotted line here, to bend up, ever upward towards larger, fewer corporations. I mean, if you have not billions, but parts of trillions of dollars of capital available to you, you know, you may play this game in, 30s, in the 30s. Um, and yet at the same time, it also blend, bends down in the blue teeth uh, towards local applications where AI becomes affordable or available. And both, in both of these tensions exist simultaneously because they're part of the same discourse. Uh, the part of how we buy and sell um, AI. In any case, the expectations are indeed great. Um, my hope uh, today is uh, simply to remind us that Dickens in some way already wrote this book and to nudge us, uh, as it does in Great Expectations, to turn away from uh, the kind of uh, a world of social advancement, wealth, and class, and towards rather modest increases um, in affection, loyalty, and conscience. What would it look like to outline what resources are available to us in the LDS tradition to think towards a more self-checking, modest, and humane um, set of human relations that undergird um, AI, automation, and statistics? So this is how I'm understanding statistics, or excuse me, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is people, people using statistics, statistical tools, then wrapped up in often a kind of crude, and I want to be clear, I'm not talking transhumanist, I'm talking crude post-humanist uh, philosophy, uh, which often looks like uh, images like this, and then deep fat fried in techno capitalism. That's, that's where we are today. Um, uh, right, and that's what I'm, ex what I'm offering today is an alt AI or an exploration, an alternative genealogy of what artificial intelligence has been and um, could be if we were to learn from other variables. Namely, I think using some of the Soviet materials that I'm going to turn to in a second, we can control the last two variables here um, and think about how people have been using statistical tools elsewhere. Uh, namely, the Soviet century, as this book um, outlines, uh, uh, reads and offers a statist tradition. A statist and statistics are you know, etymologically the same. Before we had the word statistiken from German, statistics in English, we had political arithmetic, um, which I think is interesting, often tied into large state explorations. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, ways of thinking about statistical governance um, over the long uh, last uh, century. What can we learn from that? and besides simply controlling for the techno-capitalism variable. Um, and let's just take a moment to talk about that again. Today I would read um, AI is standing for, among, among other things, additional investment, it just as often as it stands for um, artificial intelligence. Even from its coining, uh, John McCarthy in 1956 Dartmouth was effectively creating a term that was gunning for grantsmanship and funding to separate himself from the previous generations, the saturated market of cybernetic researchers. Um, uh, in, in some ways, I'm, I'm not d dismissing the whole topic. I'm talking about the word. 
the word AI attends, has much more to do with PowerPoint than it does Python. Right? I think if we can uh, take that and look at it differently uh, and open up new possibilities, uh, we'll have some new things to say. So what if the future could look differently, and what if the past already has? Here are uh, some provocations that I hope will uh, um, um, uh, help us uh, see things anew. Oh, no, before I do that, um, I want to just briefly note, what would it look like, before we look at the Soviet space, to look through the lens of LDS values? What would an uh, LDS uh, um, kind of AI approach look like? I think some of them would acknowledge that we are emerging from an American 19th century restorationist origins to become a modest, but interestingly transnational, uh, Americanizing force for modernity. Um, and if you can kind of take that, think about our minority, um, a minority modernity that moves people from persecution to uneven privilege, then I think we have the terms by which we can begin to think through our own value systems, our own sets, what work uh, the, the church is doing in the world. Simultaneously, I think that a, an LDS approach to um, AI might uh, be consonant with the uh, very recent um, March 13th, 2024 guidelines um, uh, uh, that the church released. Um, it might recognize a kind of balance of possibilities. Elder Gong calls it neither giddy nor alarmist, quote unquote, um, in our approach to this tradition. Um, that would take seriously collectivist communities. It would think about beehive-like record keeping and data processing and diversely embodied uh, creators working um, uh, in creative material environments. I think including especially, as John mentioned, the, our stewardship over this earth. And finally, I also think that perhaps an, an LDS approach to AI, whatever that might look like, would have a materially grounded understanding of what intelligence looks like. Nancy, in many ways, has opened um, the hood to us this morning already. Not necessarily artificial intelligence as a term, but whatever intelligence means. Uh, that's a question mark that I think we are distinctly well positioned to try to think through. So if some of these are not a terrible first draft, get some ideas up in the air about what LDS AI values might look like. I'd like to offer some working propositions meant to provoke and, and, and um, mix up our, our thinking a little bit. Uh, again, drawing from uh, this project I'm working on. So here are eight propositions. Perhaps the best way to understand AI is to look away from it. Uh, namely, we didn't know that the French Revolution was the French Revolution. There were a lot of revolutions happening, in, as Eric Hobsbawm points out, until after the American uh, Revolution, after the Spring of Nations, after the Russian Revolution. And perhaps so it is with AI today. Uh, let's find some perspective by looking elsewhere. Um, second, what if we were to take a different tact on what latter day might mean? Namely, instead of, we might be wrong to project apocalypse and singularities continuously into the future, when in fact, another reading of latter day might invite us uh, to take um, uh, comfort from indigenous and post-colonial um, uh, peoples and insights who remind us that the apocalypse has been happening locally and unevenly for centuries. Uh, so 70 years about Soviet thinking around statistical governance, a core commitment that remains continuous today, ended the world as they knew it. It was a, it was a local apocalypse with ended in Chernobyl plumes and a collapsed economy. And so I wonder if the Soviet experienced a kind of proverbial AI apocalypse, what can we learn in these latter days, the days that come after? Maybe John Ogden has just pointed out that uh, the apocalypse once normalized still can work out. I'm not trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to neutralize uh, apocalyptic language here. Third, um, offering the idea that smartness is a trap, by which I will simply observe that if you look across the classical liberal tradition of great books, there are thousands of pages devoted to terms like wisdom, knowledge, education, analysis, judgment, and fleetingly few devoted to intelligence as a term, except for Machiavelli and Hobbes, who use the term almost exclusively to talk about state intelligence or spycraft which I think is interesting. So in other words, what I'm saying is that smart and intelligent as terms arrive as relatively new kids on the language block. Smart, et etymologically, um, is related to the German for pain, schmerz. Ow, that's smarts, right? A cuttingness, a sharpness, uh, a dose of embodied pain. And that's okay, I'm simply trying to recognize how smartness anchors us in bodies. <laughs> 
Uh, fourth, uh, just a bit of context, I think this is a gloss of my first book, um, the 20th century showdowns between market capitalists on the one hand and status bureaucracies on the other, that that duel is for losers and everyone lost the Cold War. And the multipolar world with heartbreaking fratricidal wars that we are experiencing now, including the expanded um, invasion of Russia into Ukraine, makes this point even more uh, poignant. In some sense, then, I wonder playfully if we might play around with uh, a revision of how the Soviet uh, Union did not end. Are there ways of seeing big tech as a kind of new Soviets today? And now, let me be clear here, there are way more differences than there are similarities, but at least we can pause to consider as a cautionary reflection that when we're talking about superpowered oligarchs committed to long-term planning and population-wide surveillance, we should be a little bit unclear whether we're talking about late Soviet or whether we're talking about not tech as it's experienced here, but multinational tech executives, right? And I hope that we can begin to make that political economic distinction. Uh, all right, and now it's these last three that I want to develop in a little more detail today. Um, my hope throughout is not to adopt any tired tropes of AI skepticism or cynicism, or uh, the opposite, which again, I think is much of the same thing. My hope is to uncover uh, and brush off previously un overlooked material from the prickly bramble of history uh, that might help us refresh our, our modest and sustainable approaches to AI going forward. Okay, so these three are going to draw uh, from uh, this ongoing book project. Um, I'm happy to say more about, the, here's the working table of contents. Uh, and what I'm gonna do to make those for, uh, last three points is I'm going to briefly run through uh, four case studies. First, uh, from left to right, Lobachevskian non-Euclidean geometry um, and what, what it teaches us about complex spaces since the 19th century and how the 19th century continues to work today. The second, Markov, the Markov chain behind which I see as a kind of theotechnic or a rereading of chance in our relationship to God. Uh, third, Andrei Kalmogorov's formalization of modern probability theory, which is definitely behind a whole lot of Bayesian probability networks and uh, neural networks and things that we're looking about. Hopefully it will also teach us why AI hallucinates, or rather I prefer the term concocts today, and also why the future, like the past, has long appeared queerly plural. And I'll talk about why Kolmogorov offers a kind of analog to the Alan Turing story in a second. And finally, uh, fourth, closest to me, Yekaterina Yushchenko's subtle, often ignored technique for transforming programming into a complex space. And in particular, the role that women play in powering uh, uh, computing then and now. And each, I think, has a, a moment of LDS resonance from the previous values I've mentioned. Okay, overarching arc, all of these serve a tradition of thinking about AI as people using statu uh, statistical tools in complex spaces. Uh, so let's buckle our seatbelts, we're gonna move quick. Uh, first, uh, the, the geometer Nikolai Lobachevsky helped formalize complex spaces in the 19th century. And it might just be that this entire case study is an excuse for me to put these two portraits next to one another. Uh, ready? Okay. <laughs> so on the left, or is it the right? In December of 1829, Nikolai Lobachevsky rejected the fifth postulate of Euclid to restore a more flexible original form of geometry while being accused of harboring prizniki bezbrozhye, or the, the signs of godlessness, in a Muslim-majority autonomous region of Kazan, Russia. On the right, or is that the left, a few months later, in April 1830, Joseph Smith, consider the analogy here, rejected the Nanaisian creeds of the third century to restore the Church of Christ, a more flexible yet original uh, form of Christianity, while also being accused of heresy on the bustling edge of the American empire that was before westward expansion, upstate New York. And I'll save uh, for later the kind of playful uh, um, analogy or suggestion that 19th century Mormonism, Mormon history follows uh, a hyperbolic coordinate system in its polygamous relationships, that there's more than one line that can pass through a point and not intersect another line on a plane, and that 20th century Mormonism in particular um, bends back into uh, the far right, into an elliptical coordinates of the nuclear family and American capital, a kind of concentration and core centralization 
namely for Lobachevsky, that less than one line can pass through a point and not intersect another line on a plane. Instead, I'm just going to simply emphasize that Lobachevsky's non-Euclidean geometry gave the 19th century formal tools for thinking about space and environments complexly. And it sped subsequent innovations in lots of practical applications like geography. Turns out the Earth is elliptical. So is every other heavenly body. Uh, and elliptical geometry is really useful for that as well as really abstract concepts like the Riemann spaces or Hilbert spaces in mathematics that we'll come back to in a moment when we talk about Kolmogorov. So what's my point so far? Um, besides the lovely, like, you know, creedal postulate rejection uh, in the early 19th century, that the 19th century taught us modernity, how to think about complex spaces, and AI inhabits a complex space. Okay. Uh, second. Markov chains, a uh, theotechnic or a tool for rethinking our relationship uh, with God. So here on the left, Andrei Andreevich Markov Sr. Um, and by the way, his son, exactly the same name, but Jr. is a major Soviet cybernetician, mathematician. Um, it was 1905 and he was living through the brewing social unrest uh, in St. Petersburg effectively an anti-Tsarist, anti-Orthodox mathematician, um, and everything about this unrest uh, and historical environment uh, helped organize him against his colleague there on the bottom right, Pavel Nekrasov, pro-Tsarist, pro-Orthodox colleague um, in Moscow. I mean, it's just like a meme uh, rap battle between these two, uh, almost too stereotypical. They fell into a fascinating, hot theological de uh, debate that ended up, I argue, rewiring the world. Namely, Nekrasov, on the bottom, argued that since the law of large numbers holds for populations generally, this shows an existence of a beneficent god, in particular, a god who wills us to enjoy free will. And that um, he's basically arguing that um, emergent patterns prove that chaos was not supreme or general, but that each of us in expressing our free will participates in probabilistic patterns that um, express a higher order of God's will. Uh, Markov says nonsense. And in 1905, he develops a simple technique, a Markov chain, to show how both randomness and order can coexist in local, small, but complex spaces. A Markov chain today, which we might think of a memoryless uh, sequence of um, events describes what happens next based off of things now and only now, it's memoryless. We'll come back to that in a second. So let's start at the top left. Uh, for simple events or points in space, they can have causal but still random relationships with other events. Imagine for a Markov chain that you're a drunkard in 1905 St. Petersburg Public Square and you're trying to determine what your next step is. Uh, a Markov chain would describe the current state of affairs and the likelihood of the next step. Do you go from A to B? Do you stay at A? Uh, the next step of the system depends only on the current state. Independent events can take random walks. Uh, not only is Markov chain a theological technique and a response to a theological debate, we see its heirs scaled up today. Markov chains, fields, models, uh, applied in countless forms across, across, the top right, um, across the top there, Brownian motion. Uh, Markov chains are fundamental to information theory uh, since the post-war period, um, directly inscribed into much machine learning, neural networks, and even page rank, the heart of the Google search algorithm. Basically, if you want to think about like every time you search for something on Google, um, you imagine that you're taking a Markov chain random walk across the, the, the public square of internet links, and you're stumbling like a drunkard, <laughs> not knowing what the past is, you only know the present moment onto what ranked order of sites are according to the strength of other sites linking to those um, uh, original sites. Um, in other words, if you've ever felt out of place without your Google um, search tool next to you, know that technologists have called Markov chains memoryless for a reason. Right? Perhaps there's a, a kind of, we're inhabiting the memorylessness of, of, of a Markov chain here. Uh, lots of other cool things to talk about there. 
Brownian motion, both Wiener and, and uh, Kolmogorov will later turn on, uh, rely on time series and, and uh, uh, Markov chains to, to do more. But let's, let's keep moving. Just a curious aside, I want to note that in 1913, um, Markov presents arguably the first paper in digital humanities to the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg, which is a hand-counted analysis of over 20,000 characters uh, derived from the first bit of Yevgeny Onegin, Eugene Onegin, the master, Pushkin's masterwork. Imagine like Romeo and Juliet, right? Um, meant to demonstrate Pushkin's prose genius. And while I don't think he's wrong to pursue that goal, I think the story is even more interesting in that Yevgeny Onegin performs his Markov's point in another way, as the self-possessed and powerful heroine Tatiana embarks on random walks uh, uh, through forest pathways, even reading the marginalia of the library of Onegin, her would-be lover down in the bottom, only to discover in these chance encounters, in this stumbling upon um, chaos of the current moment, of the tragedy to come, namely that Onegin is a cipher and a misanthrope. Onig in is a deliberate play with negation um, in, in the Latin. Uh, digital literacy, I think, has ever been learning to read the traces of humanity uh, between the li lines of code ever since. So what's the point here? Uh, that AI rests on a technique born out of regularly rereading theology. Uh, the Markov chain is a theotechnic. Next, Kolmogorov's probability. Uh, so natural language processing, Bayesian probability ne um, networks, and other modern day techniques behind machine learning rest on an almost unacknowledged revolution in modern probability. So by unacknowledged, I simply mean that a lot of, most of us don't know about it, and then when you talk to mathematicians about what Kolmogorov did uh, here, Kolmogorov, I should have had a better, apologies, he, the third uh, photo to the left, he is on the left not in glasses. Um, uh, but when you ask mathematicians about what Kolmogorov did with probability, uh, they'll effectively say he solved it. In 1933, in, um, when he applies probability theory to measure theory in this famous book, Grundbegriffe der Wahrscheinlichkeitsrechnung, in it basically he shows, he lifts probability from this low-hanging, messy empirical science full of sample error sizes and sampling issues and counting beans and flips. He takes that and generalizes it and gives it a mathematical engine by showing how probability axioms map one-on-one -on -one onto measure theory axioms. And measure theory is a pre-existing form basically of infinite dimensional geometry, um, uh, which again we inherit from Lobachevsky through David Hilbert. So imagine a space that can have any amount of, a conceptual space with any amount of dimension. So what Markov, um, uh, what Kolmogorov shows is that in a infinitely, uh, potentially infinite measure space, one can understand just as Markov did, an event as a point, um, as a point, and the likelihood of an event causing another event as a link between that point and another point. Um, I'll show you some examples here in a second. Uh, and with this, you can create trivially complex, many dimensions, as, wish, as much as you wish to say. In short, as the mathematicians point out, Kolmogorov's uh, probability theory just worked. And on it can be built all the subsequent tools uh, for machine learning, Bayesian probability networks, and the rest of it uh, today. In fact, it wasn't until like 50 years later that somebody at Stanford proposed a revision to his initial theory. So if, if you've understood like basically what matters and so what, now I want to offer a curious story about how history and society can help us think differently. Even a tumultuous and revolutionary story. Maybe not unlike um, Alan Turing's invention of the Turing test, which he did while under uh, uh, British police anti-gay uh, anti uh, pressure. Here, um, Kolmogorov, then a young elite and uh, 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 gay mathematician, according to Masha Gessen, formalized our techniques for seeing the future in a very moment when his life was, his future was deeply, deeply compromised. So Kolmogorov wrote and published the book in yellow in 1932 and then 1933, just as 1930 to 1936, peaking in 1937, the Stalinist purges were rising to their terrible height. And Kolmogorov was being forced, as he's writing this vision of how do you model the future, forced to publicly testify against his former mentor, mentor Nikolai Luzhin, here seeing the stamp, the second to left at the top in a Stalinist show trial, something like the far left 
uh, photo. And that Kolmogorov was being blackmailed by the KGB simultaneously for his alleged gay relationships with his closest lifelong colleague, Pavel Alexandrov, on the right in glasses. So what I'm offering is that a story about how Kolmogorov formalizes how it's possible to model infinite potential futures at the very moment when he could not possibly know his own. His theory is performing his life. A knock at the door at night would routinely but unpredictably disappear neighbors, comrades, into the gulag. He was guilty of nothing except loving his best friend, and yet his future with the state might end at any moment. How else to respond to radical revolutionary uncertainty except to formalize a model of infinite futures? And without this crucial, crucial pivot point, again in 1933, probabilistic networks do, are not thinkable today. Instead, we have much machine learning uh, that assumes modern probability um, um, spaces and Kolmogorov measure spaces. Um, uh, let's, let me try to give an example here briefly. Um, on the left is a, a conceptual space, a measure space, in which all possible uh, outcomes of two dice rolls are imagined. These rectangles represent different dice events. We can then predict the likelihood or the link strengths of different events and their relationships, different colored subspaces within the, the space on the left, and map them out into a geometric space of trivially large dimensions here on the right. If this seems imaginable, right, your move from the left to the right, do this while the KGB is knocking at your door, uh, disappearing your colleagues for lesser uh, infractions than what, they think, what you think they have over you. I think there's two reasons why this matters. First, again, modern probability theory on the right um, uh, offers us an imagination of potentially infinite many futures, whereas the earlier stuff, frequentist statistics, measures one real world, or at least it's an approximate convergence to one real world over time. Whereas modern probability theory does not assume an ontological unity, rather the present fractures into any number of possible futures. Second, this fracturing, I think, helps us understand why large language models today hallucinate. Or perhaps better, we can, I, I assume a better word because it assumes no will, is concoct. Consider how a complex probabilistic space composed of different vectors of knowledge, uh, imagine, go back to your, uh, your, your, your inhabiting a space like this on the right. There's a bunch of different vector fields with different knowledge statements in it. And two of those existing vector spaces are already true. One of them says, France gave a statue to a new country. And the other one says, Lithuania is a newly independent country. And now you're asked to uh, um, imagine what the most likely connection of those are. Is it not unreasonable, as a measure space of infinite dimension, that perhaps France gifted Lithuania the Vilnius TV tower in 1980? No. Flash. It didn't. This is a hallucination. Uh, but our per as we like to imagine, I'm not sure if this is true or not, uh, that humans' perception of reality eventually converges to one, I think it's important to at least acknowledge that maybe we're a little bit more like LLMs in that their imagination, like Kolmogorov's, trivially diverges to many. So a conception of infinite future matters um, elsewhere, too. Um, let me just briefly, again, sidebar a couple other ways of thinking about populations. Consider how, under the guidance of um, Theodosius Dabzhansky, a Soviet Ukrainian working at Columbia's fruit fry labs in the late 1930s, after Kolmogorov, uh, we have the modern synthesis, or a combination of genetics and evolutionary theory that took shape around statistical population landscapes. And these, uh, these uh, landscapes, uh, statistical population landscapes or fitness landscapes are probability spaces of a kind for measuring population change over time. Thus, we have the 20th century welcoming models for complex spaces of changing environments, evolutionary forces, genes acting within populations. Here's, uh, and they can do so dynamically. The population are the gray dots. Um, and yet, it can model these possible futures uh, statistically, without determining it, without one future, but many, that described and predict the multiple converging futures themselves as an environment. Um, so here the environment changes, that's the, that's the rainbow blue plane. Again, multiple futures modeled in a complex space. <laughs> 
Here's one more. Um, in and after World War II, there's this technique called the CEP, the Circular Error Probable, Krugovoye Varyatne Arklenina, um, that would join with a coming generation of the scientific technological revolution in military technology across the Cold War to drive the evolution from bombers to intercontinental ballistics to rockets to thoughts of nuclear tipped satellites to smart guided missiles eventually. That CEP would kind of begin it. The CEP, the circular error probable, was a simple measure of a weapon's precision. So look at the thing on the right. I'd imagine that you're seeing, we are imagining a, a, a green target zone, a black dot that's our target, and a spread of red strikes. Does that seem reasonable so far? Except at the center of it, there's a Soviet technique. There's a modern probability at its center, which means that the black dot is not the target's location. It is the fixed perspective of the gunner into the future. And the red dots represent not the strikes, but the plural, in fact, trivially many possible locations of the target. The target is moving in time. One target, many futures. Like Komogor uh, Markov's drunkard, drunkard next step in a public space, like Komogorov's future amid the purges in the 1933, like a demographer surveying a population amid climate change, it's hard to know how to survive when the next step is plural, when the space is complex, and when stakes are so high. So I'm not claiming, of course, that Komogorov was the first to formalize uh, the ideas of many possible futures. Um, but as we can develop elsewhere in the book, um, there's lots that we can learn from the uncanniness of this particular corner of the early 20th century. Un Unheimlichkeit, here, uncanniness, unhomeness, uh, is a term that Freud popularizes perfectly in 1919. What's the point that I'm trying to make with all this dark, gloomy material? It's that we have long inhabited complex spaces and that we now have the tools to formally describe that fact, a la Labachevsky, Markov, and Kolmogorov, so that our orientation to the future can appear long, has, it has long been queer and subject to models in complex spaces. Finally, a fourth point, um, and I think this is to a, a rarely but increasingly acknowledged degree, that women power programming, and they long have. Here's a largely unknown story of how uh, uh, Yekaterina Yushchenko, an algebraicist and uh, probability theorist, helped turn computer programming into the complex space that it is today, or at least almost, uh, through the development of what she called Nipriamnaya Adresatsia, or indirect addressing, um, in a 1955 book, here, Address Programming. And this is the same technique that Harold Lawson would call pointers almost a decade later in 1964. Donald Knuth uh, famously would considers pointers one of, the th one of the most valuable, quote, valuable treasures in computer programming. So let me tell you a little bit about her uh, fascinating backstory. Yushchenko, uh, after surviving World War II um, in Central Asia and fleeing with her family in the late, late, seven, uh, late 30s, like uh, Komogorov, they, they too were persecuted for their resistance to the state. They fled to Samarkand, Samarkand um, uh, uh, where she studied and then came back to Kiev, Ukraine, in, um, uh, after the war, and where she was hired in 1952 to lead the programming team of one of the first programmable digital computers in Europe, uh, Miesem, uh, the Miesem, the, which means the small electronic calculating machine, uh, was located here in the bottom right of, uh, in a two-story dormitory next to an abandoned monastery and cathedral with electricity but without running water in the forested area of Fiofania in southern Kiev. The Miesem, or small electronic calculating machine, was not small. It filled both uh, floors. It managed a stunning 50 computations per second via 6,000 vacuum tubes. And this hardware limitation is actually my whole point. I'm not interested in scaling that up. I'm not, like, I'm not gonna make a sufficient change in quantity, changes a, a quality, a historical materialism argument. It's about the hardware here that really matters because like all von Neumann data bus processors, the computer that she had to work with would process instructions one bit after another, just like they do today. And she wondered, how could such a tool be used to calculate mathematical problems of enormous complexity, right? 
air turbulence, low orbit um, variations, fluid dynamics, other obviously military programs that she and her team and Kolmogorov and the rest of them are all tasked with. How in the world can you translate programming's complexity uh, input into linear outputs for the, uh, that the hardware can follow? Well, uh, indirect addressing, it was her answer, uh, that, or what we call pointers. Namely, uh, it's really simple. A pointer points to a bit of stored memory elsewhere. Uh, like a page number in a book index, it tells the program where to look for something stored elsewhere. And this simple semiotic index uh, makes it possible to store not all memory in the lowest level of language, but it allows you to create and then move between lower and higher level languages all the way up to right, the, the block-oriented uh, programming that our kids are using. Software gains a kind of architecture, an architecture of arbitrary complexity, thanks to the simplest techniques, uh, like a pointer. So I think uh, another point to really stress here is that while we have seen an emergence here in the, the literature in the bottom right, um, finally have begun to establish just how vital women are and have been for the history of computing, especially for programming. Um, just make a couple points here. On the uh, left are the programmers for the ENIAC, the first digital computer um, in the world uh, under von Neumann. Uh, and on the right uh, top, we see programmers at Bletchy Park who helped Alan Turing's team break the Nazi Enigma code. Uh, and then, by the way, lost Britain's competitive edge in computing by insisting, as Mar Hicks shows in Programmed Inequality, the book in the middle, um, that through basic institutional organizational questions like patriarchal hiring and management structures, uh, Brit Britain lost its computer edge. Um, to this, I hope that we can add in the future the stories of Yushchenko's team here seen in the winter of 1953 as they taught Miesem to speak complexly. And I'd be happy to say more about Nadezh Demyshenko or Marina Morkharavets or others who she's working alongside. So what in the world are my points and how in the world do we tie all this together? I'm not simply saying that Slavic speaking stories matter, although with a nod to our keynote, Slavic women in particular matter. Uh, to the story of AI. We might also look here to the inventors of PayPal, Grammarly, WhatsApp, Ethereum, Solana, Chainlink, Telegram, uh, for what my colleague Maria Tabozovic and I call the tech avant-garde of uh, the post-Soviet IT talent. Namely, groups of hundreds of thousands of people trained to technocratic excellence in free, excellent public educations, and then often set loose as a mobile, globally mobile IT uh, labor class, bringing ferocious talent, often for relative cheap, to Boston, Silicon Valley, Tel Aviv, Shanghai, Berlin, and others today, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So in this case, I think it's a prime reminder that AI, while it, it must have necessary condition uh, hardware, it's never only been about the hardware. In fact, some of these um, IT talents can program, and program elegantly, because they have, did not see a computer before they arrived in the mid-90s. They, they learned to program uh, 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 economically um, without computers. So the story of Soviet AI, in other words, has faced multiple apocalypses or the ends of the world, and yet it lives on today. And here I feel um, much in line with what John was in inviting us to think about. Um, so let's review our main points again and see if we might see them differently in light of some of the materials that I have up in the air. Uh, it has no necessary commitment to human-shaped forms. No, um, it has no additional investment branding exercise. Instead, we can see across Soviet AI just one of the many transnational traditions of people using statistics, uh, statistical tools um, to model complex spaces, not for one future, but for many futures. That's, that's what I see continuous. I think we can also see number two that while we're prone in our discourse to talk to flex and exponents and power laws, we often overlook the historical and social raptures and ends of the world that are all about us. We don't need to look to the future to see that some have already survived, a kind of AI apocalypse, a moment where predictions fail, or in the famous title of Alexei Yurchak's book, where everything was forever until it was no more, about the Soviet Union. And at the same time, here and again, Others are living a utopia all about us. And the coexistence of multiple real worlds, I think, helps humble me 
and limit my predictions of the effects and futures of AI, even as I hope to make them better with you all. I share the common project. The present is also many. What else may be the healthy, healthiest inheritance of an LDS tradition that works in pluralities? We have plural Zions, plural scriptures, still today plural ceilings, even plural gods. Is it that much more not to generalize too far into our beautifully, vexingly pluralistic world and future? I'll skip over three to five now simply to emphasize what I hope we also see across this in six is that computational spaces have long been complex. Space has been curved since well before Lobachevsky, sorry flat earthers, and it bends with Einstein to the space-time distortions of the gravity of material bodies in motion or in the scrum of live relations one with another, if you want to go theological. Our models of the future since Kolmogorov's teams are also models of our own historical present. And nothing dates quite as quickly as a prediction of the future. And software, since Yushchenko's team, has translated between complexity and linear um, uh, simplicity. Again, formal social historical compl complexity all work together to help enliven what not only could be, but has been the history and the future of AI. Number seven, uh, many of the techniques that we've talked about, the things that still drive AI today, have theological inflections and sometimes origins. Lobachevsky's anti-credal theories, Markov's chains that, reckons, uh, that welcomes plural gods of prediction and chance, Kolmogorov's personal prayer that he might survive the heresies of his mentor, Lusian, who he's betraying, he's being forced to betray publicly. What were Lusian's sins, by the way? Among others, they were for encanting the Jesus prayer, in which like his transfinite set theory, the name of God, or the God has a name, but no measure. And he did this in the basement of an Orthodox cathedral in secular Moscow. Uh, uh, and by the way, the future that Kolmogorov is inhabiting in this moment is so unpredictable that even as dozens of people disappeared around him, he survives the apocalypse, and so does his mentor, Lusian. No, no one knows why. We don't have a known explanation for why Lusian survived. The past as well as the present is uncertain, and our tools for modeling the future reflect this baked-in contingency. I think throughout number eight, we've also seen another resonant LDS point, that our embodied theology achieves transcendent kinship through subtle communities of pluralistic mammals living in thick relationships one with another. Everything we've talked about, Lobachevsky, Markov, Kolmogorov, Yushchenko, those are not just four names, and if it comes up in Q&A, L1, M2, K3, and Y4 are simpler ways to remember them. But in fact, each of these rests on communities or embodied teams and relationships that have mostly alighted for the sake of time today. Yushchenko's teams of women and men programmers Many of them had survived World War II only by hiding, only to find work because many, so many of the men did not return from the Eastern Front. It's predicted that if you were born, if you were a male born in 1924, of your five male peers in kindergarten, you alone would be alive at the end of the front. It's just staggering loss. Um, uh, And so it's in this space that surprising things happen, like a reclamation of women's labor and the, their intelligence and the ways that they have created programming today, right? Uh, the surprising contingencies of history is cut in all sorts of directions here. Kolmogorov too, in the scrum of life, is living in conversations with colleagues near and far. He's being accused, villainized for having published in German, which was the science of the language at the time, in, in open networks, living networks with his colleagues. Um, the Markov chain takes this whole ethos of the social revolution in which he's living. P simply, machine learning has long hosted a, its own type of low-grade communitarian kinship and sentience. So here are my great expectations and conclusion of, for AI. I envision a future of artificial intelligence that's ringed with women and men, kinship and care, queer relationships, and uneasy plural futures. I envision a future very much part of the past and present, but a bit more conscientious, more loyal to those living debts, and more caring to those who use statistical tools for AI. You know that old phrase, AI won't replace your job, but someone using AI will? I think it's halfway there. I think, or rather, it misses the starting point. It's that AI already is people using statistical tools. And that's good if modest news. It's people all the way down. AI. In the, in the title of Norbert Wiener's book is The Human Use of Human Beings.
Finally, last moment, I recognize that some of what I'm saying here may have a kind of like weird uncle vibe, if you know what I mean, like you gather together with your family over Thanksgiving and there's that one guy who insists on saying the wrong things out loud and you're all like, ugh. I get it, that's how I feel about a lot of the Soviet materials too. And perhaps this is also a common lesson of the social media era in which we live, as well as a gentle inversion of the anthropomorphic principle, anthropic principle, which is I think that we could recognize that each of us have a bit of that weird aunt or uncle in, 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 in each of us, and that by modeling how the history, the present, and the future of AI has been more plural, more uncertain, and more modest than we might have otherwise predicted, we can see in the weird aunt and uncle at the other side of the table of AI an uncanny reflection of ourselves and thus respond with more generosity, hospitality, and community, precisely like I see embodied here, to the larger human family project and indeed break out, set new uh, place settings and welcome to the ongoing feast of people using statistical tools, a worldwide family in these, the AI latter days. Thank you. Thank you.